the greatest honor and privilege I've ever had in my whole life to be able to uh, present Mr. Steve Wozniak, the inventor of the Apple computer, with uh, an honorary membership for a lifetime to our uh, Denver Apple Pie users group, and also the t-shirt that the officers of the club wear. Mr. Wozniak? <laughs> Okay, and we now have another person and professor of mineral economics, Colorado School of Mines, is also here to make a presentation to Steve Wozniak. Mayor? Well, all I have is some words for you, Mr. Wozniak. I am uh, really impressed. I teach, I really am, I teach economics and, and microeconomics and one of the things that we talk about in that class is entrepreneurs and, and what is it that makes one person an entrepreneur and another person not an entrepreneur? Well, looking at Mr. Wozniak, I'm not sure. <laughs> He looks like one of us. <laughs> but uh, really, it's an idea. But it is, entrepreneurs aren't the only people that, that are made special by ideas. Sometimes revolutionaries have, are, are special because they have an idea. Well, I consider Mr. Wozniak to be a sort of revolutionary in that, that he's, uh, I think, part uh, responsible in large part for a revolution that's going on in education and in the way we entertain ourselves and our children. I was listening to KVOD today and there was an ad for a, an optical firm. I was kind of interested to notice that in this ad they were saying make sure that your children get their eyes checked regularly so that they don't see a blurry computer screen. <laughs> So anyway, Mr. Wozniak, welcome to Golden. Welcome to the Colorado School of Mines. I look forward to your talk. Before I officially introduce Steve as our speaker, we're going to do the door prizes. The door prizes tonight are wooden apples that have been machine turned <laughs> and painted, but they've been signed by the Waz. <laughs> what we have done is put all the members' names in the hat because we couldn't find a way to use our projection video up here tonight. And uh, Steve, you want to draw some? Okay. First name, can't read it that, I'll get another one. <laughs> Gary Dennis Peters. Okay. Come on, just like all of them. You sh Everyone should know that when you put something into a box to be picked out, you're better off if you crinkle it up because it takes up more volume and it's more likely to be selected. <laughs> okay, next, Dick Justice. Dick Justice here. Here he comes. The next one to get ahead on things is going to be Richard L. and Gail Herkenrader. Correct? Hello? Herkenrader? Well, we'll give them all away somehow. Here's the next one John T. Soma. An, an apple signed by me or somebody? A couple of them might say Mickey Mouse, but I don't know. William B. Tracy? Come on up. Congratulations to all the lucky winners. Frank D. Reeves. Earthquake. 
Frank Reeves. Do we have Frank Reeves here? Frank D. Reeves? Nope. James H. Gary. Is James here? Good. Congratulations. I'm going to reach way into the corner this time. Ron Stock. Is Ron Stock? Nope. Dr. D. E. Harvey. Brian Fine. Any relation? Brian Fine. <laughs> Gary J. Stanich. Now we're almost batting 50%. We'll get out of here soon. Bruce E. Tyen. Bruce Tyen. <laughs> Al Nelson. <laughs> when we get to the last apple, we'll be a little more careful in how fast we go. Howard Boltman. B-U-L-T-M-A-N. I don't know, it's a database off a computer. <laughs> okay, Arthur P. Butler. Arthur Butler, please. Oh, here he comes. Another winner. Ron Stock. Ron Stock here. Edward B. Wood. Edward Wood. Somebody's getting up. There's Edward over there. Okay, Bobby Shanahan Nelson. Three more apples to go. Stephen D. Adams. Adam's apple. <laughs> Robert Bryant. How about Steve Feldman? Steve Feldman. Okay. Two to go. One of these out. Daryl W. Hardy. Here goes the last apple. The last one. Looks like Steve Wozniak. <laughs> Terry Hoyle. Terry Hoyle? This is the last apple. If Terry's here, just yell. Okay. I can't read this name. Prague, PJ Ravel? Ravel? One more chance. Anybody wants it? This is the lucky one. Douglas R. Cook II. Okay. Suzanne J. Peterson. Joanne Hudson, <laughs> Richard B. Walker, oh, good. <laughs> Clinton L. Serber, okay. William N. Gunderson, Bill Gunderson, Troy Johnston. <laughs> Richard D. Bird. I'm making them up, you know. <laughs> Richard D. Bird. Whoever, when I get you, you better scream. Paul K. Bach. <laughs> Greg Peterson. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the plane delay was like... <laughs> Okay, well, um, yeah, I'm going to take, take the mic now since yeah. I'm here. The plane, of course, today the weather in Denver, I guess, uh, finally hit. And it was the day that this morning I chose to teach my two-year-old kid how when you're out for breakfast, you take a sip of orange juice, look out the window casually, but don't look at anything, and just look back in real quick and look right at somebody and say, nice day, isn't it? <laughs> so... We were flying out here, and of course, I assumed that Apple would always request seats 2C and 2E on the airplane. But we got seats 2E and 2F, so I'm not sure what it means. Anyway, of course, you know, Colorado, I have a very strong connection with Colorado. It's odd I've never been here to speak before to an Apple or a computer club 
But um, I went to school here my first year of college, uh, fell in love with the state of Colorado, intended to move here all my life. I was a delegate for Hart this year, for Gary Hart, in his strongest support in the state of California. And uh, I also had a strong connection to the, the rock and roll music promoter, Phaline, because they did our booking for our last festival. And I have strong friendships there. As a matter of fact, they told me that tomorrow, uh, there's a Cindy Lauper concert over at UC Boulder, so I don't think I'll miss that. Um, a lot of things have been happening recently in computers before I get into some of our, our, the early Apple history. Uh, you know, Apple has made some, some strong technology stances in the last year as far as compatible peripherals across our product lines, and one of our directions is towards the Sony 3.5-inch disk drive. But as odd as it sounds, this is not a, not a technology that was pioneered by Apple. If you remember, Osborne had the three and a half inch monitor. <laughs> mouse technology is one of the big, the big uh, pushes this year at Apple, but uh, we had mouse technology back five years ago. It was usually a little, a little furry critter running underneath our cassette tapes. <laughs> um, in the early days of computers, we put out a very basic computer. It was just a raw little board with 4K of memory and a microprocessor and a keyboard, and it talked to your home TV, and it had a bunch of slots, but it was really, it couldn't do anything. There was not one program that would somehow do something useful for you. And we put it out to the world and said, start exploring. What are the proper printers that are inexpensive? We didn't know what items were going to belong with personal computers back then. So we threw open this computer and said, everybody start doing whatever you can with it. And eventually, the whole definition of what a personal computer was evolved from that. It wasn't that we had very clear thinking that we were trying to impress upon the world what the personal computer has become today. We didn't really see it that way. We just sort of were a part of this massive thing that started happening because largely driven for economic reasons. It was finally very, very uh, inexpensive. The users set almost all the standards as to what, so what do we want in the way of a personal computer? What kind of keyboard? What kind of resolution on the screen? What, how much, how important is color? Um, what sort of printers in what price range? These were defined by users. I'm going to get into sort of the story, partly from a, you know, a, a first person point of view, leading up to Apple and some of our early uh, developments. You go back to school, and I come from a place called Silicon Valley, California. And it, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of electronics and a lot of engineering around there. It's the place where the first integrated circuits were uh, outside of TI were, uh, were done. The company started in our area. Uh, that's why it's called Silicon Valley. And a lot, you find there are a lot of kids who have parents who are engineers. That means there's a lot of electronics kids around. If your interest happens to be electronics because your father had a few batteries and resistors and light bulbs, it's easy to find people who have a common interest or that you can impress it on. And uh, we would form little groups, little tech kit groups in our neighborhood. And as odd as I, I think about it, I don't think I ever had one friend who was not one of the tech kids. Maybe every kid really wants to do it a little bit. What does it mean? It means, you know, buying all the latest walkie-talkies and strapping wires on people's fences without knowing that you're supposed to ask permission because you're trespassing. Um, but running house-to-house -house intercoms that way and, uh, you know, doing little pranks, making noisemakers and reading popular electronics. Um, early in school, there's a good chance, in, especially in the Silicon Valley area, that you'll get directed towards electronics projects for science fairs. Your teachers will direct you, your parents will direct you. So a lot of kids come up with electronics in them. Not everyone, not, probably not more than 10% are the, you know, the normal, you can look at any school and spot sort of the math scientific types. You know, they get a reputation in their school and they get good <coughs> feedback from the other kids about how smart they are in math and science, and that's what drives them in their life. Um, I was rather fortunate because I accidentally stumbled across um, computers. Uh, throughout my life, my father might give me a manual and have no idea I was going to read it and start studying gates and logic and try to come up with my own improvements and build science fair projects like this. By the time I got to pretty much to near the end of high school, well, my electronics teacher, and it was unusual for me to take electronics. If you're an outstanding math student headed for the scientific realm of life and headed for college, electronics back in the 60s was tended to be on the shop side of school. It was like auto shop. It was not a college preparatory curriculum. I just happened to have such an interest that I was not only a bright math student, but also a good electronics student. And when you put math and electronics together, you've got the heart of engineering. Um, so anyway, my electronics teacher realized that I had a lot of computer 
you know, ability and whatnot that went beyond anything he could possibly teach me in school. He knew that as long as I was in class, I was just going to sit around playing pranks on the other students, like wrapping little hair wires around certain circuits so when they plugged in their, uh, their radio, it would blow up. <laughs> and he had the perception to see that I needed something outside of the school. My math teacher, you know, was very bright, and he said, well, why don't you go upstairs from your math class up to the math, math office and work on a little computer we got up there. But the trouble is, the teachers didn't know what a computer was. There was nothing close to a computer in the school. And so I got up there and it was a little board with some relays and wires and it was not a computer. So I just found out that I'd go up there every, every Friday and I would just take off and take three lunches instead because it was during lunch period. Um, the, my electronics teacher said, he set something up where I could go down to Sylvania once a week and program on a real computer. And this was an unheard of dream when you got no computers in your high school at all or anywhere near it. They were too expensive back then. So I was uh, starting to learn how to program, and one day I spotted a manual on an engineer's desk. And I got interested in it, so they said I could have it. And I took it home, and it was several hundred pages thick, describing binary arithmetic, logic, gate diagrams, how registers are set up, and how there's an instruction set for a processor. Inside, you'd learn about 50, 50 specific instructions, and each one of them had a code of ones and zero bits, and it meant do this to a certain register inside your machine. And the concepts of sequencing and instruction set, putting little instructions together in a hierarchy and building from add and shift instructions, building a multiply. From a number of other types of instructions, building a search algorithm. That concept um, came about and it was totally independently driven. Had, didn't have a parent that helped me, didn't have any teachers I could share this with, any other students. Well, I got so interested in these computers, and it became, it was, it was my big hobby in life. You might get interested in crossword puzzles, or just any realm of mathematics, or studying some aspect of history. My thing in life was going to be computers, despite the fact that I had no idea that I'd ever have some sort of job in that. It didn't even, I didn't even think it was engineering. I thought engineering was radios and TVs. So I, got, I, I was going to study computers all my life and make that my field of expertise. The trouble is, a computer cost as much as a car back then. I mean, not as much as a car, it cost as much as many cars, as much as a house in about the late 60s. So to sit there and say, I'm going to own a computer in my life instead of a house was a very strong statement. Um, I sat down and I started thinking, God, I'd love to design these things because I'm so interested in the mathematics of computers. And I went out and I got books that showed what sort of integrated circuits you could buy, <coughs> circuits on gates, and I read, it, I read everything I could about that. And I knew what a computer was, but I had no books that taught you here are some certain procedures to follow to design the computer. Sat down and collegially worked out a bunch of gates, you know, that would just, just to do a calculator. Do a bunch of addition functions, because I knew all the logic for it. And then, then another one that would go around in a loop, it would do an addition and a shift, and it would, it would pop around in a loop 16 times and be counting how many times. Very crude designs. Integrated circuits started getting better and better. Every time I spotted a new integrated circuit that did a little bit more for the function in the same package, I would sit down and redesign the computer a little bit better, over and over and over. And after a couple of dozen computer designs, you're so self-taught. You've been, you've been reaching out and trying to get the best perfect computer designs, the ultimate right way, for so long that you become very skilled without any formal education. Um, by the, the end of high school, a computer came out from a company called Data General. And it was called the Nova. And first of all, they shipped, it was one of the first computers to sort of take an approach. It was strange. They not only shipped you an initial brochure introducing their company and their first product, but they shipped a big poster that you could fold out. And on one side, it had a picture of a big rack mount Nova mini computer, one of these big rectangular square boxes that you could theoretically hook all sorts of scientific stuff to. And on the other side, it had a version that would actually sit down on your desktop. It didn't have a keyboard just had normal binary switches and lights, but it would actually sit on a desk, and it was so intriguing to see a connection to the home with a computer. That wasn't the only love I had for the Nova computer. Looked at, on the last page of this brochure introducing a new company, they actually listed the instruction set of the computer, and they had done a very simple, elegant thing. They had sat down, rather than have 50 instructions, all with different codes, they made one instruction that every couple of bits, two bits meant which register to use for your source. Two bits meant 
which register for the destination, three bits for which of eight operations you should perform. Another bit told you if you should set the carry, and another bit said you should shift the result. And it turned out that every bit had a little meaning of its own, and it was so cleverly thought out that you could just have one instruction, and you could make up any sort of algorithm that you wanted from that one instruction. Well, I sat down and decided, well, I want to design a Nova computer. And I sat down, and my first pass through, I was shocked. The simplicity of the one instruction, the elegance of it, led to a simplicity of design to where the Nova was half as many chips as a PDP-11 or a PDP-8 or a Varian 620i, the other popular mini computers of the day. Half as many chips, because inside the way chips connect, you really take two bits, two, two little bits in, in the instruction have one meaning as to which register, you just run two wires down to a multiplexer chip, which is a selector. And it just, it just worked out to the logic of the computer design perfectly. The Nova had a more powerful and easier to use instruction set, and yet it was half as many parts to build. So the goal of my life in all my designs was always try to make it as small as possible, as few chips as possible. For some reason, there's some goodness, some showing off in doing that. Um, the, uh, I headed off to my first year of college around that time, and it was here in Boulder, Colorado, actually. And I'm looking back on it, I'm, it's almost, you can almost be a little bit proud of it in this day of, you know, hackers and what they've meant to us and what they've brought us, but I was actually put on probation for computer abuse. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a 1984 term. <laughs> Basically, I would, I had books of math tables. I wanted to do anything I could think of doing on a computer. You know, and after, of course, you know, you make programs that play games like bouncing a chess piece around. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to make all the tables in the standard mathematical handbooks so I would print out reams of paper day after day after day after day. And I had no idea. I just knew that you take a course, you take a Fortran course, and they give you a number to use, and you can run programs on that number. You don't have a concept of that early in age in your life that there's actually resources amounting to money that's being used. <laughs> the instructor was very upset when, when he had this huge bill, and I, I was like, you know, half the class for computer time. <laughs> and, you know, and I printed out a little bit of, you know, scrap paper, where the high-speed printer would good scrap paper page one, good scrap paper page two, and it would just <laughs> rip the paper up into the air. But, they, you know, I, I guess, I guess I learned from that. I'm not sure what. I was, I was at school. I was at school. I was at school to learn. Number one, I was a bright student, but studying to be just hard. You know, the goal of got to get a ton of A's, and that leads to success in life, was not in me. And I'm very fortunate for that. I picked up every computer manual I could buy. I took courses on computers and read chapters ahead and went in different orders. But there were even computer classes I took where I didn't get an A, but I got 100% on every test because if the teacher assigned a certain set of homework. Doing exactly what was being told to do was less important than learning what you could feel and have a good sense for intuitively was, was good education. So I was there and I got normal, you know, first year engineering student, good grades. But um, I was there first of all to learn not to get A's. Um, around that time, electronics, electronics always has a fun meaning in your life. If you're in high school, you can make a little device that makes a tone, a little high-pitched tone, and you can hide it in rooms or behind TV sets. And, it bothers dogs, of course, <laughs> or, you know, they can hear the high tones, and some people with good hearing can hear it, but they can't quite tell where it's coming from. <laughs> and you find, you discover in high school that generally the teacher says, no, 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 the TV's on the blitz, and it's the students who, are, who, who say, no, 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 it's got to be a little noisemaker up there. Only the teachers get fooled. Um, <laughs> around this time, first year of college, got a TV jammer. Got onto it, a friend got me on how to build a little device you hold in your hand, and you turn a knob, and it jams a TV set. And uh, so I would take it down over to one of the other dorms, because in my dorm, they knew me. <laughs> and I would take it down in the basement of this dorm, and there'd be 20 kids watching a little colored TV. And I'd sit way in the back in the dark, and I'd have this thing in my hand, completely concealed, and I would tune it perfect, and all of a sudden, you know, whatever the shows of 1968 were, it would start to go bad. And for the first few tries, I had a friend of mine in the front row get up and hit the TV, bonk, you know, and it goes perfect. <laughs> and then I jam it again, and he gets up, and after a while, he has to hit it harder and harder, but it always, if you shake that TV enough, it works. <laughs> and 
you know, people can get very frustrated when inanimate objects don't work, when they have a problem inside. It's, it's um, normally very docile, peaceful, you know, uh, college students in the days of Vietnam will turn into animals, vicious killing animals, if it's a machine that's doing them in. They could kill, you know, if it's a person, it's not, you know, it can hand, mellow out. But um, generally, they would wind up after, uh, by the end of a half an hour, it's easy to get any group of college kids hit, hitting it with, with, with chairs and pounding all their fists on the TV set if it's an important show and they've got to see the end of it because they know that if you shake it good enough, it'll work. <laughs> And I, I started visiting that dorm a lot just to see where this, where this little psychology research would go. <laughs> so they would generally station one guy right next to the TV set every night, and it was his job when every time it went bad to start hitting it till it went good. And you know that went far enough. So sometimes I would just leave it jammed, and they'd get five people up there turning every control they could find on the back and the front, lifting antennas, and and uh, one time, one time, you know. I jammed it, and it went bad, and the guy said, hey, the repairman was in, and he said it was the antenna. So they lifted the antenna up in the air, and the TV went perfect <laughs> for a while. And uh, then they had to stand up real tall, and it went perfect. And the guy climbed up on a chair finally, and it was perfect for a few minutes. And when it went bad, he stood up on his tiptoes, and it was perfect. And he came down on his heels, and it was no go. That's, that's almost as frustrating as the guy who gets up and turns the fine-tuning and it goes perfect. And then he pulls his hand away and it goes bad. <laughs> Fine-tunes it perfect and he pulls his hand away bad. So one time, this bunch of people, guy was up there and he actually, I happened to notice, a few people were at the TV set. One guy had his hand on the middle of the screen, he hadn't noticed it, and his foot was up in the air on a chair. And I noticed that, so I, I turned the jammer off. And then when he took his hand away, the TV went bad. And, and he noticed it. He detected that if his hand went away or if his foot went down, it went bad. Because they were always looking for what positions would make it perfect and then hold it. <coughs> well, um, water. Um, anyway, uh, so he's there with his hand on the middle of the screen. And he, they decided, they, they had a little bit of electricity knowledge, I guess. They said it was a grounding problem. So they sat there for a half an hour with a hand on the middle of a TV screen, and that was, that was fun. I, I had my first computer class that year, and they were teaching us how to program in Fortran. But the, there was a new engineering center that had just been built, and the classes were pretty small. So the teacher would address half of the class live, and the rest of us, two-thirds of us, would watch it on TV sets in another room. Well, I took the jammer because they used Channel 3. And, you know, I turned, I built this little jammer cleverly concealed inside of a magic marker pen. And uh, I tuned it in, and sure enough, that TV set went bad. And they all went bad, but the one went bad the worst, and it wasn't near me. All of a sudden, three TAs got up, and it was a small class, much smaller than this, maybe, you know, 150 people. The TAs started watching us so close, and I froze. I wasn't going to reach for my magic marker and get caught turning this thing off. That's what they were looking for. And I was scared. It was like 20 minutes before I could even dare think of risking turning it off. So I said, well, I'll just wait till the whole class gets up to go, because then they can't tell who it is that's moving with it. Well, anyway, I noticed about 10 minutes before class was over, they're still jammed. This guy over next to the TV set that was jammed the worst gets up to leave early. He starts picking up his books and walking out. Well, as he's walking along, the TV's going good and bad, good and bad. He goes out the door. And the TV's perfect. And, and I got a kick because the TA pointed at him and said, there he goes. <laughs> so you learn a lesson. If you're going to pull a prank and nobody knows where it's coming from, make it look like somebody else did it. And you get two pranks for one. <laughs> it's the prank theory.